Who owns the sun? It was an April afternoon and my world, now touched by the rays of the sun, smelled sweet. The light that fell across my face felt warm and clean. Who, I asked my father, owns the sun? He pointed toward the sky and told me to look up. I raised my head and squinted my eyes against the sun's powerful glare. Only a fool believes he can own the sun, my father said. Everybody sees the sun's light and everybody feels the sun's warmth. But the sun is too large, too great for one person to own. So it shines on all the earth and gives itself to every living thing. I thought of what my father had said and I believed him. I watched him as he walked away from me and went back to his work in the field. That night we sat on the porch resting after our day's work and then let the soft night sounds come to us. Somewhere buried in the deep wet grass, a cricket cried to itself. Now and then a breeze rustled the green leaves and stirred a night lullaby. The black sky wrapped around us like a soft muffler. The peaceful stars glowed clean white and comforted me. I leaned back in my chair for a better look at them. Who, I asked my father, owns the stars? The stars are too far away to be owned by anyone, my father answered quietly. No one has ever touched the stars, but everyone looks at them and everyone wonders at their beauty. The stars light the night sky and shine for all people to see. Time passed and spring gave way to summer. The rays of the hot sun burned deep into the ground. In late July, a welcome rain fell onto the earth and began to heal the scars the sun had left behind. The thirsty ground that lay cracked at dusty spirals drank deeply and once again became a rich, dark brown. Who, I asked, owns the rain? No one owns the rain, my father told me as he scooped up a handful of moist dirt and let the soil sprinkle through his fingers. The rain gives life to this earth, he said. Sometimes rain can be too strong and flood the land, my father explained. It can also be gentle and nourish seeds in the ground. But the rain cannot be owned by anyone. It gives freely of itself and falls on every land in the world. The next day, after the rain had stopped, the air again grew still and hot. It was heavy and thick, and it seemed to smother everything it touched. It pressed on my chest and made me long for a deep breath of fresh air. I stayed inside most of the day, hoping for a cool breeze. Just before dinner, it came. First, there was a gentle stirring of wind. Then soft breezes blew and began to push the hot air away. I filled my lungs and let the, cool, the air cool my whole body. It was a wonderful feeling. Who, I asked my father, owns the wind? No one, my father answered as he turned to face the breeze. The wind is too mighty to be owned by anyone. Sometimes the wind is moody and shows its evil temper. It whirls into a storm and crushes everything in its path. Or the wind can be funny and blow the hat off your head. Or it can turn a windmill and help a man do his work. And sometimes it can be pleasant and cool, just like it is right now. But no one owns the wind, my father said. It roams the earth. It is a wanderer that visits everyone and every place. The next morning, I awoke to the fragrance of my mother's biscuits baking in the oven. The smell made me hungry, so I dressed quickly and joined my father at the breakfast table. From far away, I heard the clear, sweet trill of a bird's call. A second bird answered with a stream of chirps. While we ate, the birds continued their friendly greeting. Who, I asked my father, owns the birds? Nobody can own the birds, my father answered. Everyone hears them sing their songs and everyone watches them soar and glide across the sky. But birds can fly away at any time and go anywhere they choose. They are too free to be owned, but they share their beauty and their songs with the whole world. There were wildflowers growing in the field behind our house. They brightened the summer with colorful beauty. There were lavender ones, orange ones, and yellow ones with golden edges. 
but my favorites were the pink ones that bloomed in the clearest, softest shade of rose I had ever seen. The flowers appeared so peaceful and at home in their beds. Only in midsummer, when the world was overflowing with flowers, would I allow myself to pick a small bouquet for my mother's table. When I placed it in a jar of waters, the flowers looked so lovely and their fragrance filled the house. Who, I asked my father, owns the flowers? A man can pick any flowers he chooses, my father answered, but the flowers belong to the land. The land was here long before man and it will be here after he is gone. Flowers give their beauty for all people to enjoy, my father said. If we don't destroy the flowers, they will bloom and seed and more flowers will grow in their place. I did not understand all my father had said, but I accepted it. He had told me that the world was full of beautiful things, things that could not be owned, but that could be loved and appreciated by everyone. I knew my father was a great man. He had a strong body and a kind heart. His huge hands were cracked and weathered by the sun and calloused from his work. And yet, when he put his hands over mine, they felt as warm and gentle as my mother's. My own hands were small and soft, making his even more fascinating to me. I hoped that one day I would have hands that were as strong and gentle as his. I was not the only one who had respect for my father. I noticed the way other men watch him work in the field. I knew they sometimes counted on him for help. The men called my father Big Jim, which certainly described him because he was taller and stronger than any of them. When he bent over the plow and dug it into the earth, his muscles strained and pressed hard against the cloth of his shirt. My father was so tall that I had to lean my way, lean my head way back to look into his eyes. But when our eyes finally met, there was always a smile on his face, a smile just for me, his firstborn son. My mother cooked in the big house for Mr. Finley and his family. Every day around noon, I would go to the huge kitchen and breathe in the hot, steamy smells of pies and cookies baking. My mother would fill a pail with meat, beans, and biscuits, and sometimes a piece of pie for my father's lunch, and she would fill a jug with cool buttermilk. Carrying the pail and jug, I'd run to my father, who was working in the field. My errand was a labor of love. I ran because I loved my father and because I knew how hungry and thirsty he would be. Across the fields I'd race, never slowing my pace or stopping to look around. But one day, it was late in August as I recall, the day was so hot and the air so heavy that I slowed down and walked part of the way. As I came to the west field, I heard the sounds of men talking. When I drew near, I recognized Mr. Finley, the owner of the big house, and saw another man who was a stranger to me. See that big fella over there? I heard Mr. Finley say as he leaned against the fence. That's Big Jim. He's a strong one, that man. I realized Mr. Finley was referring to my father, so I slowed my pace even more. And when the stranger said, just look at him lift those rocks, I could not help but feel proud. He's our best field hand, all right, Mr. Finley said. Why, he'll have all the rocks out of that field by the end of the week. I wish I had him working in my fields, the other man said. Yes, Big Jim puts all the other field hands to shame, Mr. Finley agreed, lighting his cigar and blowing a puff of blue smoke into the air. I wish I owned 10 more just like him. For a moment, I stood there. I could not believe my ears. Mr. Finley's words echoed in my mind. I wish I owned 10 more just like him. Owned? How could that be? It couldn't be true. Suddenly, I did not want to hear more, and I didn't want to think about what I had just heard, but I couldn't help myself. I climbed over the fence and ran across the field. The lunch pail banged against my leg and buttermilk sloshed from the jug, but I didn't care. When my father saw me approaching, he stood up straight, smiled, and waved at me as he usually did. But when he saw how upset I was, the smile quickly disappeared from his face. I didn't stop running until I was standing squarely in front of him. I just heard Mr. Finley say he owned you, I blurted out. Is that true? I asked. My father's face tightened with anger and pain. His hands clenched into fists. The muscles of his arms suddenly swelled and then he turned away. Does Mr. Finley own you? I asked again. Finally, my father turned back to me. It was when I saw the sadness on his face that I knew 
The words Mr. Finley had spoken were true. But he doesn't own the, star the stars or the sun, I reasoned, so how can he own you? My father was quiet for what seemed like a very long time. Finally, he spoke. A man is a beautiful thing, he said. A very beautiful thing. But some men forget this, and sometimes they try to keep other men captive. They buy and sell people as if human beings are no more than cattle. But only a fool believes he can really own another man, and only a fool will try, my father said. Mr. Finley may own my body, but I have a heart and I have a mind, and he can never own these. Inside of me, I'm too powerful to be owned by anyone. Inside, I am like the sun. I listened to the words my father spoke. I considered them carefully, trying to sort out the thoughts that raced through my mind. Finally, I settled on the one question I knew I had to ask. Does Mr. Finley own me too? I wanted to know. My father looked directly into my eyes for a moment, and for a moment after that, he bent down and put his arms around me, and then he began to cry. Afterward, looking back, I think my childhood was ended that summer day. Many cold winters lay ahead. In his lifetime, my father saw many changes. He lived to stand at last as a free man and to see his children attend school. One of my brothers became a musician and the other is a Baptist minister. My sister opened a restaurant and I became a teacher. My parents hoped and dreamed that the time would come when our people would not be judged by the color of their skins, but would be respected for the quality of their thoughts and deeds. I am sure my parents would have been pleased, no, overjoyed, if they could have known that one of their great-grandchildren would one day be elected governor of our state. The End